You mentioned before that the kind of distributional frequency of protein might be important, particularly for endurance athletes. And this gets me thinking about some recent research that I think it was Tromelin um, that compared zero grams of protein, 25 and 100 grams of protein after resistance training. Um, I think you've probably seen that paper. But for for a long time, there has, I guess, been this idea, um, at least in fitness culture and on social media, that if you consume more than sort of 30 grams of protein at a meal, that the rest is kind of lost. And this probably brings us back to amino acid oxidation. Um, but then this paper came this paper came out and at least the lay or social media kind of um, narrative around that study was actually no, you're, you're not wasting protein above 25 grams. You can have 100 grams of protein in a meal and that seems to result in greater uh, muscle protein synthesis. What, you know, have you have you looked at that paper and what are your, I guess, main takeaways from it if you have? Yeah, that's a awesome study. Yeah, it's Luke out of Luke's lab. Yeah, I know Jorn quite well as well. Um, I worked with him a little bit when I was over in the Netherlands. Awesome, awesome group, great study. I think you might have you might have hit the nail on the head. <laughs> Maybe the social media took took what they were saying and probably manipulated it a, a little bit. All right, so you know. Before I left the Netherlands, uh, Luke is just a fun guy, just an amazing scientist. Um, we talked about doing that study because we had an interest uh, before I left. Um, we were going to do it with uh, intrinsic labeled beef. And he was just calling it the barbecue study. Then, you know, got busy. I left, whatever. So I was real excited to see that paper um, because it was sort of something Luke was thinking about many years ago. And then to see it finally hit that they use milk protein concentrates to so sort of shifted off the beef concept. But, okay. So, so, I, so Luke has, and I, I went to the Netherlands to use this technique. Um, are you familiar with intrinsically labeled food protein? I've read a little bit about it. Sure. So, yeah, I mean, I, I made eggs here. So essentially you're, you're fortifying the food with an amino acid tracer that, and now we can trace where our food protein is going, right? So we can provide estimates of digestion and absorption kinetics, and then we can actually determine how much of the food protein is incorporated into muscle. All right. So it's a very interesting question because what you just noted is that we always wondered, um, when do you plateau, uh, the, the absorption of your food protein, right? So some of Luke's original work showed that, okay, when you eat 10 grams of food protein, roughly 50 to 60% of those amino acids become available. When you eat 20 grams, roughly 50, 50 to 20, uh, 50 to 60%. So the relative amounts are all the same, right? Obviously from an absolute perspective, it's going to be stepwise in nature. So his question with that obviously was when I eat a hundred grams in this case, a whey protein concentrate, does that same percentage stay the same? Okay. And what the cool part about that was, that's paper. When you eat a hundred grams of food protein, roughly 60% still becomes available, right? So that means the other half are going somewhere else. Um, and then what he showed was that you used a substantial, substantial amount of those amino acids that became in the circulation for muscle protein synthesis. So that's a very unique part. So he labels the food protein at a high enough level. So when you drink, in this case, drink the milk protein concentrate, you can directly trace what you ate into muscle. Okay. So that's amazing. I mean, that's such a cool technique. Um, and so he can directly see that, okay, yeah, you are. So those amino acids get into circulation and then you, you use them. All right. So Luke's a, a physiologist, right? I mean, I struggle with, you know, what's the translation of that? He was just interested in, hey, if I eat 100 grams of food protein, how much becomes available and can I use it? Now, the only downside of that is they look at phen phenylalanine hydroxylation. It's it's not, they take it as a proxy for amino acid oxidation, but the situation would have likely been very different if they would have actually took a direct marker like leucine oxidation. 
Um, but that's not to take away from that study. It's just that phenylalanine hydroxylation is, is sort of challenging to, to say it's amino acid oxidation. So what's the translation of that? I mean, it's just a cool paper. I mean, it's, you know, it's not our recommendations, you know, Luke was just showing like, Hey, if you eat it, it can get there. Um, and yeah, beautiful paper. I love that paper. It's, it's exciting uh, to see that one come out. Um, now I, I, I understand, um, perhaps, uh, people are, are, you know, maybe take that data and say, Hey, I can just eat a slam a big bolus in the morning and call it a day, but that's probably not the best way to be eating your food protein. Um, but it, it certainly gets there. And the cool part is post-exercise state. So you make better use of the food protein. Yeah, it's just an overall great, great paper. But it's more from a science perspective. I would be hard-pressed to, to translate that into, into my life, I guess. Yeah, as is often the case, you know, a study can be amazing, but the, the interpretation by the general public can sometimes be hit, hit or miss. And the what I was kind of interested in when I was seeing various takes on this by people on social media was that people were saying, well, you know, this, this sort of shows you can just have a hundred grams of protein early in the day. And that'll be just as good as having 25 grams split over four meals, but that's not really what they tested. No, I mean, um, no, I mean, it's just, like I said, the real cool part about, I mean, the, my take point was that the relative percent stays the same. That's phenomenal. That's amazing. We, our intestinal cells has the ability to get that into circulation. I mean, uh, now the interesting is what's going on. Where's the other half going? That's the more interesting part to me, you know, is the gut microbiota utilizing that extra substrate differently? Where is that going? Right. I mean, uh, there's still a large amount that's not accounted for, <laughs> you know, I mean, yeah, half showed up. Where'd the other half go? I mean, that's the interesting question, uh, to me. I mean, that's the more interesting part. And I know that's what Luke's interested in, in as well. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, that's not how I interpreted it. That's not how I interpreted that data at all. And keep in mind, that's a high quality food protein. So most of us aren't walking around slamming 100 grams of milk protein in the morning, right? It's just not how we eat. We eat mixed meals. Based on the, I guess, totality of evidence that's looked at frequency and distribution, are you of the view that there is there an advantage to multiple protein feedings throughout the day in terms of um, optimizing the system and being more efficient at using amino acids and, and reducing amino, amino acid oxidation. I think if you eat, if you eat maximal amounts of food protein, frequency becomes less relevant. I think so, but if you eat more close to her recommendations, especially if you're on a more vegan based diet, I think frequency is probably more important than if you're eating animal based food proteins. That's my hypothesis. We're testing that hypothesis right now. We're almost done with it. So we we're testing rather vegan versus animal based eating patterns against the backdrop of different protein distributions matter. All right. So I, I think if you're eating high quality food protein and the important part of that study is we held them at 1.1 1. 1. 1 to 1.2, right? So at these lower amounts against the backdrop of weightlifting. So we're trying to maximize the use of the food protein. And I, I you know, we're doing, you know, our vegan diet is properly designed with uh, registered dietitians using complementary protein pairings. Um, so maybe there's, Maybe there's, you know, I mean, we're, we've been clever with how we're using that vegan food protein, trying to make the most out of it. Use weightlifting and use complementary protein pairings. Um, so maybe there'll be no difference. But that was my original hypothesis that if you eat an animal-based meals, it doesn't matter. If you eat maximum amounts, probably less important. But perhaps where it becomes more relevant is when the quality of the food protein coming in isn't, isn't as high but you know like i said maybe we can neutralize that by using those complementary protein pairings because you can become you can you can turn those almost into more animal-like when you are clever with how you eat and most of us are eating mixed plant proteins we're not just sitting around eating soy or something mm -hmm. when do you expect the results from that to be out uh this summer yeah we're almost done we're wrapping up now yeah 
Yeah. So it's almost done. Yeah. We, it's a cool study. It, COVID, um, we would have had it done, but COVID was tough on some of uh, our clinical trials. So it got slowed up a little bit when we had to deal with the pandemic, but um, we're going to start the analysis. Yeah. This summer and we should have, have some initial outputs um, soon. Yeah, I've been interested in that. There's been a couple of trials, Hamilton, Rochelle, and then I think it's Alistair Montaigne, I'm not sure if that's how you pronounce it, that have looked at animal or omnivorous diets versus vegan diets and, and looked at hypertrophy and strength. Um, but that's been at more of a maximal dose of protein. They're up at 1.6, 1.7. And as you say, maybe once you get up there, the difference in protein quality doesn't matter. I have been really interested in knowing what is the difference at a protein intake that more reflects the general population protein intake that, that is probably more relevant to a lot of the listeners who aren't sort of prioritizing protein at every single meal. Yeah. No, it's, I mean, again, that's the benefit of food first approach. They take into account what are our current recommendations, right? How, so, I have nothing against people who are going high, but, you know, I mean, I even seen studies go upwards to three to four grams per kg per day. It's like, why, why do we go that way? <laughs> why don't you try to define this way closer to recommendations, I think would be really, really useful. And that's what we do, but it's hard, especially here in the Midwest where we are protein hungry just by nature. Right. Um, so another important aspect of that study is um, I work a lot with, um, again, I, I, Luke taught me to be more holistic in my thinking and also seeing, got a lot of psychological well-being um, uh, readouts going as well. So I'm kind of curious what happens when you take a meat eater and put them on a vegan diet, right? Maybe we're protecting their muscle, fine, but maybe some of their feelings of how they feel you know, psychological well-being outputs are impacted or maybe not, you know, maybe they're improved. Who knows? Oh, I think anytime you, if you force someone to do something that they don't like, <laughs> you might get some, yeah. some or some maybe they like it. Problems. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Some people don't mind it. You know, it's very individualized. Right. And, but the reason why that's important because our, you got to think about what our recommendations are doing. They're advocating for, and again, I, I have no issue with incorporating plant-based foods into an eating regimen. That's where a lot of our food proteins coming from, but they're advocating to incorporate more plant foods into our dietary patterns. And again, I have nothing wrong with that, but we got to make sure, you know, we also got to be thoughtful about what, what is the downstream impact of that? If any, maybe there's improvement, maybe there's, you know, obviously it's going to be individualized. Um, but again, that's the only reason I think we got to be, the physiology is important, but so is the, the psychological part of it as well. So just trying to be thoughtful about that. 